Before we get started, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in the video to come. Part 3 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime is on the horizon, and there is so much to be excited for. This core promises to have some of the craziest scenes and fights found in the final arc, featuring some of the biggest plot moments, not just of this arc, but of the entire series. I mean it when I say the events of part three will change the world of Bleach forever, and that's only the beginning. So, seeing how much there is to look forward to, I wanted to kickstart this month by simply indulging in a bit of hype. These are nine incredible upcoming moments to look forward to in part three of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. It goes without saying that this video will feature enormous spoilers for the remainder of the anime, so watch at your own peril. I might play a little fast and loose with the definition of a moment throughout this video, but regardless, these nine entries help to showcase exactly why this next section of the story is really one to look out for. I'll also be discussing how I think the anime might change certain parts of the story where necessary, including what new content they could potentially add. Also, a little more housekeeping before we get started. Obviously, I don't yet know what chapters part three will cover or where it will end. As such, I'm basing this list on the two teaser trailers we've had so far, but who knows, the core may end later in the arc than I anticipate. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume the core will end around chapter 654, the end of the battle between Kyoraku, Nanao, and Liel. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. So, part two of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime ended in a slightly weird spot. Many of us predicted that the core would conclude with the end of the titanic battle between Ichibe and Yuhabak, and I myself thought the final cliffhanger of the core would be the end of chapter 611, featuring Yuhabak stabbing the Soul King, but that wasn't quite the case. Rather, episode 26 ended somewhat awkwardly, stopping short of the final two chapters of the battle, and instead foregoing a real cliffhanger, choosing to focus on Ichibe's thorough beatdown of the Quincy King and his seeming victory. This meant that we missed out on Yuhabak's inevitable return and the awakening of his true power. Yes, Yuhabak's godly ability, the Almighty, will finally make its appearance in part three most likely in the first episode, in fact. I've gone on record before saying I'm not a huge fan of the Almighty as an ability, it's just too broken, making writing around it difficult and contrived. But there's no denying the impact it has on the story, and I'm interested to see how it's handled here in the anime. We've already had a glimpse at it with Yuhabak wielding it in the brief teaser trailers released so far, and in the surprise flashback in episode 24, but fellow readers of the source material know how much havoc this power eventually wreaks upon the world of Bleach. It's interesting, the Almighty as a power isn't in Bleach for long at all, yet it really went on to define Yuhabak's character moving forward, and partially Hashwolf's as well, but also the final third of the Thousand Year Blood War arc itself. It's the Almighty that really lifts Yuhabak into the realm of godhood, so I'll be keeping an eye open to see if the anime begins sowing the seeds of his eventual downfall much earlier than the source material did. Up next, we have the first of a few huge moves that will occur during part three of the anime. Yuhabak, having absorbed the Soul King and much of his power, uses that newfound strength to begin rebuilding his Quincy Empire. Ripping the icy buildings of the Vandenreich from the Seireite far below, Yuhabak forges the foundation stone of his new world that will sit at the very centre. Varvelt, transforming the royal palace into a gigantic frozen Quincy cross in a really fantastic piece of imagery. This new bastardised version of the fallen palace also houses in its centre a massive, imposing and frankly incredible looking fortress that serves as Yuhabak's final stronghold. The creation of Varvelt is a massive moment for the story and the world building of Bleach. Not only does it set the stage for the final battle, but it represents the fact that at least in the moment, Yuhabak has actually done it. He's won. 
The most sacred holy ground of the Soul Society falls under his control, and for the finale it's the Shinigami who are now the invaders. The tables have turned. I can't wait to witness the creation of Varvelt in the anime, giving us a great look at just how impossibly powerful Yuhabak has actually become, while also restoring the Seireite at the same time. It's a total paradigm shift, throwing off the balance of power and putting the Shinigami firmly on the back foot yet again. Next up, as the most recent teaser trailer pretty much spoiled outright, part three is going to be chock full of returning fan favourite characters. After a long wait, Grimjo is finally going to make his full reappearance, joining Ichigo and the others as they prepare for their assault on Varvelt. Alongside the former sixth Espada, another popular Arankar is returning, Nell, now back in her adult form for the first time since the Waco Mundo arc. Though unlike the source material, the anime has wisely made sure to keep Nell around during the second Quincy invasion, even if she's only glimpsed briefly in the background. Like Grimjo, she arrives through a Garganta, meeting Ichigo and the others on one of the ruined cities of the Zero Division. Some other returning faces include two former members of Execution, the Fullbringers, Riduka Dokugamine and Yukio Hans Vorlberna, both of whom had been missing since the Lost Age arc in the source material. However, the anime has already hinted at their arrival once before. The two of them, along with the aforementioned Arankar, are part of the task force designed to infiltrate Varvelt, with their powers in particular being instrumental in engineering a route into the enemy stronghold. Like Grimjo, both Riduka and Yukio represent two former enemies of Ichigo, now working alongside him, which is always awesome to see. Their joining up with everyone else represents exactly exactly the sort of thing I wanted from the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Multiple characters from disparate corners of the Bleach universe all coming together to take down a worthy world-ending threat. While we're on the subject of these returning faces, I'd love to see them get a little more to do in the anime. Obviously that's true of both Grimjo and Nell, but I'd also be up for seeing Riduka and Yukio do a little more too, Neither of them even leave Yukio's digital box in the source material, meaning they'll probably only be in the anime for one, maybe two episodes at the most. Admittedly, there is a nice moment to be had between Ichigo and Riduka where he demonstrates just how much he's grown since their last encounter, but still, I'd be up for seeing more of them. I guess Yukio does leave his box very briefly when he escorts Ginjo and Tsukishima to Varvelt, but... I'm talking a little more than that. Alright, so far these all sound like great and exciting story moments to come, but what about the fights? Are there going to be any at all, or is this going to be a firmly plot-focused part? Well, don't worry, of course there are. Part 3 is more than going to have you covered where fights are concerned. While there likely won't be as many fights as we saw in Part 2 as the once city-wide outbreak of war becomes a lot more streamlined, what does crop up should be of the highest quality. For example, Myri's battle against Sternritter C, the compulsory Pernida Panka Jazz, is a surprise highlight, not just of the arc, but of Myri's entire Bleach career. Although we're really only a few episodes out from Myri's battle with Giselle, the mad scientist's fight against a gigantic left arm is where he truly gets to shine, pardon the pun. It's a diverse, compelling battle that's constantly both engaging and surprising, while even managing to be a little emotional too. Pernida's shrift is terrifying, and I can't wait to see it in action here. On the flip side, I'm really hoping Pernida won't be CG once it and its clones become colossal in size, but... I guess we'll have to see. As one of the longest fights in the arc, it'll be interesting to see if they try and cram it all into one episode, like they did with Ken Patchy vs. Grammy, but considering this fight in the source material is longer than that fight, and Ken Patchy vs. Grammy 
barely worked in a single episode. I'd be very surprised if they actually do that. Honestly, considering how little material we have left and how many episodes are yet to come, I think these last few battles may get to breathe a fair bit better. I'm also hoping for a little more insight into Pernida itself. Episode 24 already gave us a taste, but I'd love a full flashback, the likes of which we simply didn't get in the source material. Either way, this is a fan favourite fight, and I'm hoping they do the first of the Schutzstoffel battles true justice. Moving now into the top five, at long last, it is finally Ukitake's time to play a role. With the death of the Soul King threatening to completely destroy all three worlds, the captain of the 13th Division steps up, revealing the fruits of his mysterious Kami Kake ritual, first teased in the post credit scene of episode 25. Thanks to the Kami Kake, Ukitake offers up his body in order to become a vessel for the right arm of the Soul King, Mimihagi, effectively morphing himself into an anchor to continue to hold the rapidly merging three worlds in place. This was of course Ukitake's big moment in the final arc, and it will likely be one of the most talked about scenes in part three. We've already seen the inky alien darkness of Mimihagi play a huge role in setting the tone of the first teaser trailer, so I'm certainly looking forward to where they go with this. That being said, I know I'm not alone in hoping to see a lot more from the character of Ukitake before he meets his fate. And of all the potential new content coming to part three, we've heard that Ukitake does seem to be getting some extra scenes and dialogue, so I'm definitely optimistic that the anime will try and deliver with Ukitake where the source material ultimately couldn't. What would I like to see in this regard? Well, it is truthfully hard to say. Looking at where and how Ukitake appears in the tail end of the second Quincy invasion when basically all of the fights are well and truly done, it seems very unlikely that he will be given a battle of any kind, which is a little disappointing, but it's all about the logistics of it. Ukitake's role only lasts for a few chapters at best, and during that time, the remaining Gotei 13 soldiers are left completely alone inside their current headquarters. The Quincy don't arrive until after Ukitake is already dead. I guess it's completely possible that Ukitake could have a new scene before he arrives at the Stronghold to help with the healing of defeated characters like Kenpachi, but I'm not really sure how that would work. I think it's likely that we see Ukitake considering his position a little more. Maybe we get a more detailed look at his past, including the ritual that saw him possessed by Mimihagi in the first place, which is only very briefly glimpsed in the original chapter. And perhaps we'll see how, if at all, that possession has affected him throughout the years. It's also possible that it's through Ukitake that we learn much more about the Soul King and get more insight into Reyo's own backstory. Maybe through his possession over the years, Ukitake has seen the truth of the past as well. Again, we've got no way of knowing, and while I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Ukitake step up in a huge way, I am hoping his role is fleshed out a little more as well. Just as Myri and Nemu vs. Pernida promises to be an amazing spectacle, so too does the next fight on this list. Kyoraku and Nanao vs. Leal, which pits the Captain Commander against the leader of the Schutzstoffel in an epic battle of biblical proportions. Of course, everyone is dying to see Kyoraku's Bankai in action at long last, but there's so much more to this fight than just that. Leal is a genuinely terrifying opponent, and if handled correctly, could provide a monstrous visual showcase for the anime. And this fight is even longer than Myri vs. Pernida, and I would be amazed if it wasn't split across two episodes, with the cliffhanger probably being something like Kyoraku decapitating Leal and then Leal coming back, but we'll have to see on that front. Either way, like Myori's before it, this is one of, if not Kyoraku's best fight in the entire series, featuring an in-depth look at his backstory and his relationship with both Nanao and his own family. However, where I don't think the Myori fight needs to be altered much, I do wonder if the anime will tweak this battle at all. 
specifically in regards to its controversial Deus Ex Machina ending. Personally, I think the fight will play out exactly the same as it did in the source material, but I think they could try and hint at Nanao's sacred Zanpak toe a bit earlier than immediately when it needs to be used. It would be cool, for instance, if the anime did say, give us an expanded look at the Soul King's backstory, maybe through Ukitake, Perhaps there we get a mention of Shinken Hakyoken if the context fits at all. Regardless, with Kyoraku being my favourite captain, of course I'm looking forward to this. Based on the first teaser trailer we received for part 3, it's possible this battle will be the climax of the core, so hopefully the team pulls out all the stops. However, as far as fights in part 3 go, there is one that I am more excited to see. And that's mostly thanks to all of the baggage that may or may not come with it. Hashwolf vs. Basby is a battle unlike any other in the arc, delivering on a surprising emotional gut punch of a duel between two Sternritter, and more importantly, two former best friends, as they now find themselves on opposite sides of the war after Yuhabak's Owls of Aelin at the end of part two. While the battle itself is pretty good and will give us a chance to see Burner Finger 3 after the anime cut that scene previously, it's of course the Friend Saga flashback that I am most invested in. Taking us 1,000 years back into the past, the Friend Saga was originally our only real glimpse into the historical context behind the conflict of the final arc, giving us a small look at Yuhabak's blood-soaked rise to power through the lens of a young Hashwath and Basby, who team up to take down the Warlord, only to suddenly find that destiny rips them apart. The flashback added real, tangible depth to both characters that was desperately needed, and I'm kind of hoping the anime can take that one step further and provide additional depth and screen time for even more Sternritter. Despite Basby actively joining the Sternritter by the end of the flashback, we never saw anyone from the present day forces, which was a big shame. I'm hoping if given extra time thanks to the number of remaining episodes that we see some other familiar faces here. Characters like Askin, Robert, or Kirge, for example, who may very well have been a part of that initial army. Personally, I'd love for them to dedicate two whole episodes to this, fully showing the formation of the original Sternritter and shedding light on the rise and fall of the Lichtreich. Ultimately, the Vandenreich work as villains outside of the fact that we don't really know anything about the vast majority of them. They are all missing some kind of context, some kind of backstory, some kind of extra dimension, and this would be a great way to finally make that happen. I'm actually somewhat optimistic about this too. The anime has surprised me twice now with fascinating insights into the conflict from a thousand years ago, with a flashback from episode 24 being especially enlightening, and I'm really hoping they're able to do the same again here. And now in second place we come to the one moment, the one element from part three that I imagine the vast majority of fans and viewers are looking forward to the most. Yes, after a long wait, it is finally time to throw back the curtain and release Sosuke Aizen from Muken. As Yuhabak absorbs the Soul King's power for himself, Kyoraku realises that they need to enlist a higher calibre of strength to defend the Soul Society. And after an excellent chat between two devious schemers in the dark depths of the prison itself, the head captain manages to convince Aizen to join up with his former Shinigami foes. Admittedly, the wait to see Aizen again hasn't felt quite as agonising as in the source material since the anime gave us a brand new scene between him and Yuhabak, but yes, he is finally almost back. Like with Ukitake before him on this list, I wonder if Aizen will be given any additional scenes because he really doesn't get to do an awful lot. And it's a little tougher to achieve that with Aizen too, since he'll spend the entirety of his time in this core strapped to Chair Summer, which will be iconic in its own way. Personally, I think Aizen's screen time will be limited to what we saw in the source material, 
if he's going to get any new or extended scenes, I think they will come in part four instead. But regardless, there is going to be plenty of eyes and goodness to be had here in part three. It is of course going to be awesome seeing him return, witnessing him obliterate the Soul King's overflowing Reiatsu to rescue the Gote 13, and of course to see him use his signature spell, Kuro Hitsugi, once again. This time to even greater effect than ever before. But what I'm really excited for with this character is to see his interactions with the Shinigami. This whole sequence, surrounding the part of the story that I tenuously dub Rayo's death, features some of my absolute favourite character moments in Bleach, the coming together of so many different voices, and I can't wait to see Aizen involved in all of that. Honestly, I'm kind of hoping he interacts with some other characters as well that didn't get a chance to say anything in the original chapters, maybe someone like Shinji, for example. However, as we come to the end of our list, for me at least, there is one part three moment that I'm excited to see even more. It's the crux that the entirety of part three is going to revolve around, the cataclysmic event that the entire arc has been leading up to so far, the death of the Soul King. When you speak of major plot developments that affect and shape the world of Bleach, there are very few bigger than this. Sure, Ichigo vs. Yuha Bark Round 2 takes place here as well, within the Soul King's desecrated throne room, but that's merely a piece of the larger puzzle that is Rayo's death, and the same is true as well of the brief confrontation between Ichigo and Uryu. From the incredible twist of Yuha Bark's Rayatsu forcing Ichigo himself to deliver the killing blow, to watching the Soul Society, Waco Mundo, and the world of the living start to tremble and collapse, this this is everything the story has been building towards the end of the world. Back in the Arankar arc, despite Aizen's lofty ambitions of murdering Rayo, it always felt so very far away, no matter how close he might have actually come. Here, as a reader, I was watching the culmination of a decade's worth of storytelling unfold before my very eyes. From Ichigo and his friends' desperate attempt to stop Yuhabak and Uryu to the sheer hopelessness the Gote 13 experiences as the Soul Society crumbles around them, this single devastating move is the catalyst for, well, just about everything else on this list. Of course, as with most of these entries, I'm hoping for a little more too. I really do hope we get to learn more about the Soul King and see his flashback, his history, his torment in full and with real clarity. I don't know when exactly would be the best place for that to happen. There's various possibilities, to be honest but I'm just hoping that it does. For all the Thousand Year Blood War arc's flaws, Kubo really did a great job, I think, with the death of the Soul King, giving it the gravitas that it deserved and depicting the race against time that then followed for the Shinigami. There's an overwhelming sense of struggle as the story reaches its natural apex, promising to transform the world of Bleach forever. It's simply, I cannot emphasize enough, doesn't get any crazier than this. Thanks to this moment, part three of the Thousand Year Blood War our anime looks to be the most consequential yet, and that is something to get very excited about. But that's it for the video, guys. As always, I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What do you think of my list of the top nine most exciting moments to look forward to in part three of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime? It is going to be an absolutely crazy one, but also, crucially, I do think this is where we're really going to start to see big changes, big deviations, big additions to the source material. Let me know down in the comments below what moments you are most excited for. Do you agree with my list at all? I would love to know your thoughts down in the comments below. But as always, I want to end this video by saying a massive thank you and giving a huge shout out to my supporters over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you so, so very much. If you like what I do here over on YouTube and you want to support me another step further, you can support me over on Patreon as well to get your name in the credits just like this and to get every video I release absolutely ad-free. All right, guys, but until next time, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.